right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a great presentation today. Um, my name is Megan Kuhn, and I am uh, the communications uh, person uh, who helps uh, our digital ag team, and I'm filling in for uh, Dennis Buckmaster, who usually moderates these, um, as he had another commitment today. But I'm really excited to welcome you to uh, this um, edition of the Data Driven Agriculture webinar series. Um, it is a weekly every day, every week on Thursday at this time uh, through May 13th, um, and it is sponsored by the Digital Ag team, um, as well as the Wabash Nash Heartland Innovation Network, who uh, sponsors quite a bit of the work um, that we uh, showcase in this series. So just um, a heads up on some of the topics uh, coming up. Uh, we kind of stick with livestock uh, for a couple times this one, and then we kind of jump into some digital forestry, which is really exciting. Um, and then um, through April and May, you'll see the topics and hopefully you've seen all of those on our uh, digital ag resources website. Um, today, uh, we have John Scott, who's going to talk to us about um, UAV use in livestock, and he's going to cover uh, several different aspects of it, from sheep to cattle uh, to forage management and pasture management, and just kind of talk about some of the things he's done and some of the things that you can do. Um, it is a recorded uh, presentation, so we'll, we'll have that. Um, if you um, at any point have questions for John, please go ahead and use the chat during it, and he's kind of going to kind of monitor it. Um, and may answer uh, during the presentation, or we'll definitely have time afterwards for some live Q&A. Um, so with that, um, we'll, we'll start the, um, the presentation if you want to leave your cameras off. So um, during this time, and then we can, if you can turn them on at the end, um, and when you want to ask a question. So welcome, and let's begin. Hello, I'm John Scott, the WIN Purdue Extension Coordinator for Digital Agriculture. And today we're going to talk about some UAV uses in livestock. This is by no means an exhaustive list of uses, just some of the uses that we've seen uh, and that we've worked with in extension. Uh, so we're going to start off today talking about sheep, and then we're going to talk about cattle and some uses in cattle. Then we'll look at forages and pastures and some of those types of things. Um, from there, we're going to take a look at pasture maintenance and infrastructure maintenance and pasture, so fencing and, and barns and things like that. So like I said, to start things off, we're going to talk about sheep. So if you look here in this, this image, uh, this is a 400 foot ceiling. We're looking at this, this pasture. So this is about a three, two and a half, three acre pasture. Uh, you can see where the, the fence line is on this outside ledge, which has been sprayed. It's like here, we've either got a, a path of some sort or maybe another fence line. In this case, in Persian, this was a fence line, which was separate. So we cut this paddock. Out and then have the main area, so a quarantine area, if you will, and then the, the larger area. Uh, if you look real close, you can see you know, the sheep paths, uh, especially up here. Here's the barn and the area around it. And then you can see where the sheep go and come out. And being herd animals, they eventually cut a path. Same way with cattle, most of the herd animals. This one here, this is the treasure path. You can tell. If you look here, and there, and there, you can see those are actually piles of manure. So the barn was cleaned, and this is where the tractor grew up to. Put the manure around in the pasture. There's some there. There's actually some over here as well. Just to get that out across the pasture. Uh, over here, we've got like a fire ring or a fire pit, a bird pit. We've got some tile in here. There's a scar. We've got some tile. You can see some tile right through here. Like some um, brand new tile new insulation in here. If you look real close, you can kind of see as the, how the world works. You can see that line with this different vegetation with a straight line. And even comes through here. And you can see it's a little greener, a little darker green through there. So there's a, a tile main that runs through there in the middle of that pasture in the entrance over in this creek. And we can tease all that stuff out just with one quick still shot. This is not a stitched image. This is just a still shot. And the other thing that the nation we point out is the sheep themselves, which they're right there. So you can see that little cluster of where the sheep themselves are actually at. Now from here, we can't really tell how many sheep are there. So what we did is we did a digital zoom. So again, this is a digital zoom specifically. This is not a mechanical zoom with the camera or we're doing this with the drone. This is something we do in post-production. So we have this image actually, and we just zoom in where people can just scroll in, and the, the pixels are there, the, the resolution thing, that we can get an image that looks like this. With this image, and even from that four foot height, you can still get a pretty good head count. We can count the number of years. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
we've got eight years, which is, is what we would expect. And then we also have the lambs. It's kind of hard to count the lambs here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But it's kind of hard to tell. There might be two here, there might just be one. Here, I think that we've got three. Looks like three black ones, uh, probably triplets. But there might only be two. It's hard to tell with the shadow, the way it is. And you get a general idea, but it's hard to get a really super accurate head count. So what we did is, okay, this is 400 feet. We flew out about 75 feet above the ground. So this is above ground level from the road to the off. But we're still around that 70 to 80 feet above the sheep themselves. If you look here, we tell them not really that worried about the drone. They're not disturbed in any way. They're not, they're not bothered by it. One of the questions that we have is, you know, if we fly over these things with the buzzing, they'll start running, um, especially with cat. It seems to be a concern that's brought up. But we're seeing that these sheep, they don't have that issue. Um, quite frankly, they, they, for the most part, are just the droning uh, of the UAV of they form. The thing we can do here is we can get a better cat. We can start seeing them. So you can even see you know, more colors, so there's like that one with the black spot. Uh, if you look here, you can see her, there she is from 400 feet. Here we can see her with that black spot. We can see this one, here's a dark headed one. Uh, here we've got a black spot on this, this U. We can start teasing these differences out. Um, and this is just what we saw with the drone from some of the air. Like the last one, we went ahead and did a digital zoom so that we could zoom in a little bit closer. Again, not a mechanical zoom, just a digital one so that the resolution that we're seeing in this image is actually in this image. It's just there's a lot of the noise. So when we, we zoom in, we can really see what we're seeing here. And you know, here we can do a head count again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight big views, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten babies. So we, we were right, we had ten babies. Um, the three of them are pretty dark. Again, I, I think those are probably triplets. Um, but we're able to see this detail. We can see the one here with the with the spot. We can see, you know, this one here is shedding. These are cobs, um, and they're they're shedding. This is springtime. Here, this one's pretty well. She's already shed. This one here's got uh, just some dwarf in her, so she's not going to shed as much yet. She'll shed more in the summer. She's pretty young, still, so they don't usually shed quite as, as well when they're younger. It just depends on the on the you and their genetics. But we're able to tease these things out. And this is again from 75 feet. We're not right on top of them, we're not disturbing them, and we can start seeing these things. Here's a video where we actually use the drone to herd the sheep. So this is where we're using the drone to try to push them up into the barn a little bit. Try to put this video real quick. Alright, so there we go. Start heading out. In this instance, the operator, me, I'm up here on the porch. Did you see that? We just went up in the air. So when we go up in the air like that, we throw it on the propellers to speed up. It makes it sound like a high pitch. And that high pitch noise would stop it to keep the sheet moving up towards the bar, which is where we wanted to go. So what I will say on this point, uh, so I've worked, we were able to herd the sheep up into the barn from the pasture. We did this probably three or four times over the course of about a month and a half. And by the third or fourth time, the, the sheep really were starting to stop caring about the, the, the we were no longer able to push them up into the barn. It just, it wouldn't work. It was not working. Um, they continued to graze. We would have to actually go out there and physically walk them up like we had in the past. So it has its utility. But after they get used to it after a while, it's just it's just not going to work anymore. Um, at least not that we've seen. Now it's been a couple of years since since this video was taken, so I suspect that it will work on the sheep again if in time to, if they're not used to it again. But for the most part, it has some utility, but it can be overused in the elk barns. Okay, so looking at cattle, this first image is using the the drone to count cows. In this particular case, we have a stitched image. The last thing we did for the sheep, it was a image, what was just a still image that we took, just one photograph. This is a stitched image of multiple photographs. I don't recommend using a stitched image to get a count for, for the livestock, because livestock can move. You can get a count on stationary objects, it's fine, but livestock are very 
continue to move, then it's not really a good tool for that. We did it here because we were actually looking more for forages in this particular field. This is the cornfield that was seen for cover crops and then the grazing cover crops. So when we did this particular flight, we were actually looking for forages. We'll talk about the forages in this field uh, a little bit later in the talk. But since we went ahead and, and captured it, I wanted to see how these tools would work. So we used the tool in the stitching software that would allow us to actually physically count the cows. And this is what it looks like here. So if you can see all these blue dots on here, those are where we've actually counted the cows. So we've looked at the cows and put a dot in front of the cow. Now that being said, this was nothing with an algorithm. This was done by a human being visually counting the cows and dropping the dots, where they visually saw a cow. It was not a computer algorithm at this point in time. They're getting the technology where those, those things can start happening. They can pick out the pixels and can say, yeah, it's, it's, this is a cow or this is a grass or this is whatever. But with this particular instance, um, this was all done visually with a human operator. The other thing to point out on these, flip back real quick. If we look here in the center, so like right here, in this particular instance, that's a, that's a cow, but we only see half of the cow. Here's a full cow. Here's a half. There's not really a half a cow out there in this, in this pasture. It's a full cow. Um, but because of how the drone was flying and the cow was moving, we only captured half the cow's image. So that has to be accounted for. There's another piece of a cow just to the side here. If you look, it was a little darker. There's a piece of a cow right there. You get really zoom in on this even more so than on this image to, to see the cow. But you can see what we counted on the next one. So we're able to get 24 cows in this, in this program. So it worked, but not without limitations in this case. Here's another example. This is just flying a still shot. This is flying closer to the herd. Just kind of start looking at how do they respond to the drone. Um, this is a, a Phantom 4 Pro, and we're probably 25 to 50 feet up in the air here, probably closer to 25 foot, maybe a little less. They were about 50 feet away from, from the herd there is where the drone would be physically. If you look at the cows, they're not running. They're not taking all the sprinting across the pasture here. They're curious, right? They're, they're looking at the drone. They're watching those things buzzing. But they're not really spooked. Even the, the calves there are watching, but they're not, they're not running for the hills. So that was really encouraging. Um, the other thing, you, know, you can easily see the majority of the herd here. And if you wanted to, you could fly around to that other group. This group here in the forefront. We could easily see them. Uh, we wanted to, to get a better look at these guys over here. We just had to fly over there, be closer to them, then we kind of see where they're at. It'd be really easy to get a, a head count, um, do a health check, kind of look at these cows and see how they're doing. Do I have one that's being stand up? Should we go out there and take a look at Do I have you know, the whole herd out grazing? I've got one that's laying down, and one that's really large. Am I missing one? You know, do I have a group of heifers who, you know, young cows? That, I'm expecting some calves to come out of it. And hey, I've got 10 out there. And right now, I've got nine. So, where'd that one go that might be camping somewhere they go out? Or I just need to check on them, those kinds of things. So, it makes it really convenient, really easy. Especially if you have lots of acres to get across. But you don't just really have the time, the manpower, and the resources to easily do that. So, here's another another example. This is a herd, and this is in southern Indiana. So, in this instance, this is a bunch of heifers, and they're actually underneath these trees. So if you look at this image here, this group of trees, the whole herd is actually sitting underneath these trees here. It's really hard to see here. You can just barely kind of start picking out a little bit, um, especially like right there, and maybe one here, one here. It's hard to tell the rest of them all. So what we did, the next image here, you can see them a lot more clearly. We just turned up the exposure value on that image to where we bleached out the sky, and in this area right through here, it's a lot lighter color. But what we can do is we can see inside these darker with the shadows of them. We can actually start really looking in there and see where is the herd of that. And that's where they were sitting, just to get out from underneath the sun. And this third image, this last image we've got in this series, we, we kept the EV up a little bit higher before we saw that same kind of bleached out look. But we took the drone up a little bit to look down. We'll get another look at the, at the herd, get a little closer to them. And you can see pretty clearly, you can start seeing different colors, really different cows. And get a general idea of you know, what are they doing in these things. And then from here, you could easily spin around or fly around the other side of the, the little wooded area there and look at the cows on the other side and, and get a little bit closer if you wanted to as well. 
the other thing, the drone we have doesn't have some drones have the capability you could actually just do a, a physical zoom on the camera and can zoom into these areas and see these different things. So that's another option uh, depending on the technology. So with that, we looked at we looked at sheep and cattle and some of the uses there. So we're going to delve into forages, which is ubiquitous across the, all, all species. But again, we're going to focus on sheep and cattle within the forages area as well. We're also going to do a little bit of look at some herbicides. First off, probably these sheep grazing patterns. So this was a study actually done at the Purdue Sheep Unit. Uh, it was headed up by Dr. Mitch Tynstra and his, his grad students, Shelby Bruss and uh, Dr. Keith Johnson. Worked with him on this as well uh, as the forage specialist. There are four reps in this particular study, and each of those reps were four treatments. So there was a green tree and sweet bites, sweet sticks, and experimental varieties of this VMR sort for grazing. So the experimental was a, a new low prussic acid variety that was bred by Dr. Tynstra's lab in Urban, so he's a plant breeder. Now, the neat thing about that, that prussic acid is fairly common in a lot of these different types of soils, especially if it's been exposed to drought or if it's um, been exposed to frost. And what that'll do if the sheep consume it, or any animal, if they consume that, it will break down and it's got cyanide. It'll, it'll kill them because the prussic acid toxicity, which is just the cyanide. And they respond to cyanide pretty much like we do. And if you consume cyanide, it's not, it's not really good for your health. But this particular variety uh, has a low prussic acid, so it opens up the, the potential for grazing sorghum in areas where it's probably needed, it, where it's a better forage time, especially like semi arid areas, where otherwise it wouldn't be a good choice. So we looked at this, uh, this, this image was taken on 610, so June 10. The stuff circled in red is the experimental varieties. So the sheep had already been turned out to graze some of this when we started flying it. Um, 610 was a front, it moved around 9 or 10 in the morning. This next image shows the very, so this is the plant health map. Uh, very stands for visible atmosphere, atmospherically resistant index, and it's just a, a plant health map that's generated with a regular standard official RGB, which is red, green, blue camera. Works off of the idea that plants reflect a lot of green light back, that's why they very green to us, but they also reflect back a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. And if we have an algorithm that kind of, kind of keys on that out, we can determine where the greenest plants and the, the, the most healthy plants, if you will, versus soil or, or unhealthy plants. So what we're going to do, even on first Friday, we can start kind of saying, okay, again, the stuff in this time in black is our experimental. This is what we're seeing. These are our, our trends. And then we flew it again the next month. So we waited over the weekend and came back on Monday morning on that 9, 10 o'clock in the morning period and then and flew the field again. And this is what we saw. So they had free choice the whole weekend for for all four treatments for these paddocks. And we were able to see that they really, really went to town quite a bit on most of it except for that far that far corner. But they, they didn't seem to graze that as much. So border and most one of the commercial varieties. But I think what really kind of brings the point home is when we look at this this plant health app from 613. You can see in all four of the, the treatment areas or the experimental varieties, they they seem to select that for the most part. Uh, we can see we saw continued pressure on that one area and this, this upper area right here. Continued pressure there. What was really interesting to me is almost no feeding the Friday before and probably about half of that is roughly gone. I know that they, they did this experiment and continued it and saw very similar results to that. It seemed like the sheep were selectively going after the experimental variety, the low prussic acid variety, which is really encouraging as, as this research unfolds. And I think potentially opens up a lot of options for sheep producers moving forward. So here's a study that was done. Uh, this was also with Dr. Johnson. Um, in this case, the, the operator of the pilot was Dave Osborne, who's in the ANR in Ripley County. And they had, this was at a uh, pack against them, so in Indiana. And they had four paddocks with different forage types. The first, the cattle, this is a bunch of heifers. They were releasing the first paddock on a certain day. And then they were slowly releasing the two, three, and four, but there was no back fence. So they could go back and forth once, once they got into the next paddock. They could not go forward though because it was taken down. And we think the question was, what are they going to, what are they going to eat? Are they going to sell some? So if we look here, all these cross, this area, here, here, yeah, it's all the same stuff, same variety and everything. Uh, 
from left to right across all the towns. So what was noticed, and what you can see here, is that the Hebrews definitely did something at certain, certain times. In this particular instance, they, they seemed to dislike the pearl millet, and they greatly preferred the sorghum sardinia. They really hit hard. And, and we saw the trade across the entire, the entire study. But I think it really hits home, and it really caused when you play out. Again, this is a very, but it's it's really showcasing what, what we've seen in that study. And what's interesting to me is a, as a crop guy, and it, with corn and soybeans, we see this type of map, the red is bad, the green is good. Well, for the most part, oranges are the exact opposite we're talking about. Red means it's areas that was heavily selected, and then the cattle or the sheep or whatever really went for that forage time. So you have your best rate of conversion, you have your best feast loss right there. Whereas the stuff they didn't touch at all, being because the green's done, and that's something that would be concerned. Why, why would you want to spend the money on that type of forage if the cattle are, are not going to eat it, for example? Now, the downside, the risk of some of these other forage types, especially something like this here, where it's really, really red, is it could have been overgrazed, quite frankly. They, they hit so much pressure there that it might not come back there. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that should be considered. But if you have a whole patch of that, that's probably the variety or the type you're going to want to go with, or just some of the other ones. They just are not selected. So it's definitely something to consider and something to look into. So here's that field we looked at earlier uh, when we did the cattle counting. If you look, sure real quick, right up here you can see that's where the cows are at. And if you look down here, you can see all these little green dots. So those green dots in there, um, those are the cows themselves. So they have the shadow from the cow that shows this green dot. So that's what we're seeing there. In this particular instance, we are going to talk about the foragers. Like I said, this is the, the main reason we flew it was to look at how the cattle were grazing the forage. So this is again a cover crop mix, and it was I think a 15 or 16 way mix. This was a corn field that they put this in, and then they, they turned the cattle out to graze it. So each day, the the cattle were released onto a new thing, a new paddock without any back fencing. So if we look here, we've got this is one, two, three. Four, five, year six. So we were there on day six, and they had opened up the fence and just and just let the cows in here. So the cows were not in this paddock up here yet. And they just been here. Uh, we were actually up in the air flying it when they when they released it. So if we look across here, and especially if we go the very, you can really start seeing where the the cattle were selecting the forages as they went. I think it's a good map, a really useful map. That we can start kind of looking at some possible forage selections, some selection for the cows themselves, and then start thinking through what would, what in this mix are the cattle really gravitating towards. And if you look in the print health map, I mean, if you look in here, it's like one, two, three, four, day four, and then we're only on day four, uh, six here. We've actually got some of this green stuff to show through. Some of that green, even on day three, if you look in there, you can see some of these lighter colors, these yellows, and there's even a little bit of green. So what we should probably do is go back through and walk these fields and look at those areas and say, okay, what are they not selecting? What are they, they choosing? What are they preferring not to eat in this case? What is greenest? Also, something to point out, this is just a piece of the technology. If you look down here, you can see that green and yellow kind of in the line. But it's surrounded by this red shape, and then down here it's bright green, um, bright green peninsula. We look up here, you see the shadow here? Well, that's what corresponds with this green area. And this particular part, I actually cut it out of this map, um, but it's the same thing. We've got some shadows coming through this spot, right? This spot right here, it's all red. If you look up here, you can see where there is. The reason that is because this is where the cow water is at. So the cows always have to come back here to get water. That's just the, the spot where it's located. Um, and so it's a, it's a heavily traveled area. But that green is not. And that's one of the things you got to watch when you're when you're working with some of this technology. Those those tricks. That it's not it's not wrong. I mean, there's really a shadow there. But when you look at it and think, well, that's a really healthy area, or it's a really bad area. You know, that place hasn't been eaten well. It's just because it's got to shake. It's not really a problem in the physical world. 
Yeah, here's a look at that on the ground. So you guys can kind of get a, a feel for what we're seeing on the ground. So this picture, I was I took this, I was standing up on a little knoll to get up high enough, and you can see just kind of the heads of the cows. But if you were actually walking on this and not up on a little rise, you wouldn't be able to see the cows very good, unless we were up able to get up in the air and see the patterns and everything. You couldn't see it from the ground because of how tall this covered crop was. This covered crop was probably six feet tall, uh, six and a half feet tall in some cases. And you can look over here to the this side, you can see you know, the kennel because they just walk through it, they just kind of cross down. And but they're eating the whole time. And if you look back to this image, you know, like this leaf here and some of these, you can see what the cows are as they've gone through it, they've just been just been grazing and eating this fresh green material and or that would tickle pink to be in it. It's just hard to kind of see what are they doing, how are they behaving, why are they behaving the way they are. Something we, we don't have in this presentation, but we had captured it because we actually flew above them and filmed them as they were walking. So we actually watched the cows as they moved through this this environment and saw how how do they behave. And it was interesting. That, you know, they are herd animals, so they tend to group. But then sometimes there would be one that would split off, and a handful of the 24, about half a little less, would split off of that one. We had a couple of groups, and they eventually meet together as they were going through the it, it was really neat to watch it and then be able to see them. But that's not something you could see on the ground. And see how does how do these animals behave? We had to be up three, four hundred feet in the air, so really understand and appreciate what they were doing. So this next study, we're going to take a look at uh, tracking herbicide efficacy. I want to show you uh, this image here. Kind of breaks down the plot. So there's brash, is the B, Duracore is the B, Grazo next is the G, Milestone the two four D is the M. Proclo is a new herbicide coming out once they get it from. Cortev, I want to get it registered, and then there's the entry control. This particular study was uh, done by Dr. Keith Johnson, uh, Dr. Ron Major, and Dr. Bill Johnson as well, and some of his grants in the application, and then some folks from, from Cortev. And I provided the, the drone flights to, to capture some imagery. So it's down at the Shore Range Science Farm in 2020. So the images that we're going to look at here in a little bit, uh, they start on 6 9, so about two weeks after the application. And they continue through 728 to the end of July. But I do want to point out in between here, so there's a little line that you see here and here. Those are also untreated strips. So they leave about a foot of, of untreated strip. So you can kind of start differentiating the, the differences between the, the treatments and the, the different plants. So here we go. So here's your look at 6 9. So this is the first flight we did. Even two weeks after application, you can really start seeing some of these differences. In this particular plot, the weeds, most of the weeds were actually in this plot. This is the west side. Um, the left side is the west side, and the right side is the east side. A lot more grasses were on that side, not near as many weeds what we saw on the, on the west side. 615, but we get a little bit more weed pressure. Some of them are coming in a little bit stronger, but the, the stuff that got sprayed, we're seeing pretty good efficacy. Still holding up. Starting to see a little bit of break in some of them uh, early July. And here's the last image at 728. So, what we did see is compared to the entry, they're doing absolutely nothing with the early We did have some season long resistance to, to weed pressure. We had season long control to some degree, at least it, it knocked it back. Now the weeds might have flushed in late and grown, yes, I'm not saying they didn't, but it did not come back hard enough that we could still see differences two months after application, which was pretty exciting. And then if you look at it compared to the untreated, the untreated really, really starts popping here. So you got your untreated here, 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 here. Um, the next item, we're going to take a closer look at these untreated ones. We've got them outlined here. So you can actually see those untreated plots around compared to all the stuff. We'll go through the same time series. So we're definitely able to see where those untreated ones really pop out compared to everything that's been sprayed. We're looking to spray stuff. For the most part, we had good control. The only one that, that kind of concerned me that really showed up in these images was this one right here. This is one of the milestone plots. Not 100% so sure why, or what made that one look different from the air, it had that same effect on the ground. But that one definitely popped out with a little bit more rough, more in line with what I saw visually on the, uh, the entry plots. 
whereas most of the, all the treated plots, we saw ripples on differences. One question that I had personally was, uh, what can we see from different heights? So when we flew, we mapped it. That's what the researchers wanted. But my question was, what can I see visually as far as can I identify different things? So we flew at two different heights. We flew at 100 feet. We flew at 40 feet. The 100 feet over here to the left. This is 100 feet. This side here, this is 40 feet. This is the same plot. So we just cut it in half here. This was all, both of these were taken on June 25th. Here you can see it's one to six, so that's a hundred foot one. This is three to six, so that was the fourth one. If we look at these two, there's not a lot of difference. Uh, and that's that's a good thing. When we when we looked at the resolution on these in the, the program, it didn't say there was really hardly any difference in the resolution. And then if you look, there really isn't much. There is a skosh difference in in these two. This one to me is just a, a, a slight bit more blurry. This one here just a little bit sharper, a little bit cleaner. So I think that the, I like the detail on that 40 foot one compared to 100 foot one quite a bit. Now, it could be awfully rare. I, I won't say it's not. Um, I could have changed the focus maybe for that 100 foot one and had a better image. That's entirely possible. I don't know. Um, and that's something that we're going to probably play with as we move forward and try to do, you know, maybe not all four, just different, different things, different heights, and you know, try to dial it in and say, what do we do with the focus? And, and what changes can we make? The other thing on my particular drone, it's got some, some camera issues in here. It had some camera issues. So it could be the, the camera itself that just needed repair. And that's, that's entirely possible. But still, we were still pretty happy overall with what we were seeing here. That 40 foot one, I can start picking out individual details, which is what we're going to look at next. So here's uh, July 25th. So this is the, the last, toward the end. And this is. At 40 feet. So we look at this image here. You can see here we've got some some buckhorn. You can see the, the leaf there, and it appears with this here that we probably have some some curly dock. It's it's dead or it's just getting too hot for it. It's not making it. But that's what that looks like. Some curly dock stalks. We look at this image over here. And down in here you can tell we've got some lambs quarter. Over here we've got so we've got some lambs quarter. And then you know the big thing in the middle. I'm not 100 percent sure if it's and the thistle or if it's some common ragweed. We'd have to actually get down a little bit lower, fly a little bit lower, or, or walk out and take a look at that. But it's one of those two weeds. And that's what we're seeing still from the stitched image, right? This isn't, we didn't fly down low. This is a stitched image still. So I'm really pleased that we were able to pick up a level of detail. City Forages is another, another useful, fairly new tool that we're playing with, with the drones, just to kind of see what can we do with so we use them to seed cover crops some, but we've also used them to seed some pastures. Uh, this is the one we actually use, this machine right here. So if you look right here, this is the hopper bottom. That holds about 22 kilograms of, of seed. And then the hopper itself is, is right down here. If you look at these sides, you'll see it's got these drop nozzles. So these drop nozzles, it's actually also a sprayer. So it's taking spread seed or fertilizer for that matter. And it can also spread or spray any chemistry is any type of spray you can spray, or just water, whatever, whatever, whatever you well, The only thing I've used for so far is to spread and treat seed. And uh, it's worked pretty well so far. You know, we just started doing that this fall with it. Um, we've got a, a cover crop plot up in Lafayette that we're, we're looking at, and then another pasture in Lebanon that we're looking at. So I think that the usefulness for this is going to be in small areas, tight areas, where you can't. It doesn't make sense to take a big piece of equipment into it, or in those areas where it's going to be difficult or dangerous to take a ground-based system. You don't want to go out there with the topography so bad you can roll the tractor or roll the, the seeding wagon. Uh, it might be still decent enough that the, the cattle or the sheep or the goats or what have you can get across there and graze it. And it needs to have something to keep the soil there, which is not safe to get ground-based equipment across. I think that these are a great tool to help with that because they fly through the air. They don't have to ever touch the ground at all and they can still get your product out there. Here's a video showing seeing a pasture. coming out. You can see 
the seats coming out from the bottom. Uh, up the hop. What we can control is we're seeing with these. We control the, the revolutions per minute, so how fast it turns in the opening of the hopper. And that's how we control the seating rate when we go out there and see these things. This particular instance, it was so some it was so in some zero rye as well as some perennial forage grasses in this this cleared area. So next up we've got pasture infrastructure management. So one of the, the neat uses of these is just general maintenance and inspection. So it's it's really easy to take a drone up quickly and fly around and look at differences when it comes to um, all the waters, how these pastures can be, especially if you have a lot of paddocks uh, over along a, a big area. Understanding if your water is working on can be critical, especially during a really hot period of time. So you can just get there real quick and fly around and say, hey, is there water? Is it, there? Is it broken? Do I need to fix it? Is it leaking? Is it something stuck maybe? Is the flow not right? But you can look real quick. One of the things you can do is you can actually fly down. Say you can't see because the sun's glaring or something. If you fly down low enough, you can get to where uh, it'll actually kick up the water. The propeller, the down pressure from the propellers will start rippling the water. And you can tell whether it's there or not, which is, which is really handy sometimes. So here you've got just an overview of a corral. So it's just, you know, looking at the, the corral setup. One of the things that we might use this for would just be education, building around different types of corrals and saying, hey, here's the type of corral that works. Here's how to feed the cows through. Uh, you could use it. I mean, if you could look here, you can kind of see how you could use this to inspect fences and make sure that everything's up to snuff and how you want it to be. If you wanted to look at it as far as differences and, you know, is there a better way to make the corral a more efficient way? Gives you that top down look that, that you can kind of see and piece things out. And then, you know, just inspecting fencing and the overall pasture. So, this picture here on the left is really kind of, you know, you can see how the fencing looks. You can even see all the way down the rear back. So, one of the big things that folks talk about is you have a big storm you come across, especially this weekend, it's there in Indiana, and it blows down a couple of trees. Well, you can take the drone up and fly around the fence line real quick, and you know, do I need to go grab the chainsaw and gator and head out there or don't I? What do I need? How do I need to spend my time? And you can make those decisions real quick. And you know, the other picture on the on the right here is just how's the overall pasture work? Is there a spot where we've got a, a rut maybe coming in where I need to go out and do some seeding, or we've seen some erosion that I want to try to get in front of and get behind and stop? Do we need uh, to put a new a new paddock in? Do we need to move some waters from there? What are some trends that we're seeing across that pasture? Where are the cattle paths at? Where are they spending their time? What do we need to do here? So you can get up, you can just get that bird's eye view and really get a feel for, for what's going on across the, the landscape. So to wrap things up, you know, I, I really think for the most part, we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with the technology. Uh, there's, there's a lot more that can be done. Something that we need to do with extension, I think, is, is look at it with other species outside of just sheep and cattle and see you know, how do goats respond to it, how do, how do swine respond to it, those kinds of things. I think it'd be really interesting to integrate some more thermal cameras into our drone fleet, um, and especially into that, and then work with, with livestock. I know out west, I've done some meetings with folks out there on the rangelands are doing it to find animals that are sick so they can get them in and get them taken care of. Here in Indiana, we don't have much in the way of rangelands, but I still think that it might have some utility for us, for us here, and, and we don't know until we try. And I think that there's some need for people who don't be thermal cameras in livestock, even more so than crops, for sure. And then the other thing that we need to investigate some more, I think, is the potential uses of combined livestock operations. We have flown some uh, in a feedlot situation, but it wasn't 100% combined. We haven't done anything with swine, we haven't done anything with poultry or fowl. So there's a lot that could be done there potentially. Uh, but there might be better technology for those combined operations outside of the UAV. I mean, with, with them having the buildings around them, they might have other tools that make more sense and not something that flies. So, but it, it still warrants investigation. Um, I think Purdue University College of Ag and Purdue Extension, as well as the Wabash Harvard Innovation Network for, for supporting this work and, and continued funding. So I, I take any questions and uh, we, will, we will go from there. All right. Thanks. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, sorry for the little bit of technical difficulties. That's the uh, the 
one of the downsides of doing it through Zoom and uh, um, all of this. So we will have the video up on YouTube, uh, hopefully later, um, either end of this week or early next. And so we'll send that link out um, so you can view it um, again if you'd like. So now uh, John's online uh, with his video on. Um, like to open it up for any questions anyone has. Um, for John, and if you want to, um, you can either put them in the chat or, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask live. Yeah, I've got a question here. Oh, great. Um, that, that Randy shared. Let me pull it up and read it. So the question was, can you make uh, the drone go to specific locations, uh, e.g. automatic watering places by itself? Rather than having the operator walk or drive to several places to get pictures taken, um, wonder if we can set up GPS points in the drone software to go to those locations and then take pictures at certain preset intervals whenever we wanted to or whenever we wanted to. Um, yeah, that's the, the technology does exist. So what you would do is you would just set waypoints and you'd actually have the drone go through and, and fly to those different waypoints and take pictures there. Now, the way it's the way the laws are, you would still have to have an individual operator there uh, present, a pilot. They wouldn't be able just to, to automatically take off and go and do this without some supervision. But the technology does exist that, that it, you could have a preset mission. It would go from A to B to C, taking pictures the whole time. And then it would come back home when it was done. That's a good question. Well, I, I will say that same note on, on all this stuff that we indicated here and talked about, all that technically you would need to be a commercial uh, certified UAV pilot, remote pilot through the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. So you'd have to take your Part 107 certificate because all these uses would technically be commercial uses um, because they would create value for any operation. So even if you're just inspecting waters or fencing, um, if you see an issue and you go and act on that issue, that's a commercial operation in the eyes of the FAA. And how would they, um, you want to explain a little bit about the UAV certification program um, through extension, if they don't yeah. know about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so within extension, we do have a, a UAV technology program that uh, we designed in 2019. So it's coming into its second full year. And it's a, a program um, that we put together to help people get ready and get prepared to take the, the Part 107 exam, so the unmanned aircraft exam through the FAA. And we also talk about practical uses of the, the technology, not just in livestock. We touch on livestock. We also talk about crop uses. We talk about marketing uses, things like that, so everyone can get a kind of a real good feel for the, uh, the applied side of how we actually use the technology. So it's a good test prep course, but then it takes you even further to how does this work into, into a business. Um, outside of that, to become actually certified, they'd have to, you'd have to go through the FAA and through their tests um, and take the certification exam. So it's a 60 question exam for the initial and uh, it costs, I, well, actually I just had to sign up. I'm taking my recertification next Thursday, actually. So, uh, it went up about $10. So it's $160 it used to be 150 to take the exam, but uh, you, you study for it, you go and take the exam. And if you pass with a 70% or better, you become certified and then you can commercially operate. Great. Any other questions for John? So I'll have, I'll throw one out maybe to the group. I think John and I were talking before that, you know, the, the UAV use in livestock um, is a bit bit newer uh, for him. He's just getting started. And I think one of the things we thought was, especially if this group was interested, um, if you have any thoughts of how, you know, we we could, um, John, when I say we, I mean John, uh, can, can uh, uh, use UAVs in livestock or have that, um, you know, please, you know, let, let him know you saw his email uh, before, if you wanted to throw anything out uh, today, um, we'd be happy to hear it. So that was one, just our thought is, um, you know, always looking for, you know, new ideas that would be useful to producers. Got another question. Can you please share the resources in the chat where we can find the information for commercial pilot certification? So that would all be through um, 
FAA.gov would be the answer to that. Um, and then as far as the other question on here is where can I find when, where the UAV pros are being offered? So that's online too. So extension has a UAV website and you can also get more information on the, the commercial pilot certification too. But uh, that is up. Oh, thank you, Megan, for putting that in. So that's the Megan just dropped that in chat, the extension.purdue.edu slash UAV. So that has some background information on the, the pilot, the run pilot certification. And then it also has under training um, when and where the UAV programs are going to be offered. But those are the two main sources I can really point to to, to help get ready and, and prepared for the exam and to take the exam. You also have to, there's another website, there's a link on the FAA.gov through IACRA to actually uh, sign up for the exam. And that's a, another thing you've got to go through and get a, a pilot number, a federal tracking number is what they call it. So that takes a bit of a, it's a bit of a process for sure. It's a federal government you're, we're dealing with here. So there is a process involved, but we kind of spell all of that out on the UAV website. And then Phil asked about measuring forage height and pastures to know when to switch paddocks. That's a great idea, Phil. Um, that's to my knowledge, not something anybody's looked at or worked on yet. But it'd be it'd be interesting to see what the capabilities of that are. I know that you can fairly accurately with uh, some of the tools and the stitching software measure heights. Now, is it going to be good enough to do um, you know an inch or sub inch in some cases? I don't know. It's pretty close to within a couple inches. It depends uh, when you're ready to to switch those forges and what your initial height's going to be and where your termination height would be as far as your grazing. But I think that'd be a great project for someone to work on. Any other questions for John? I'm not seeing you in chat. So. Hang on. Anything, I guess, anything you want to add, John, uh, after you watch your video again and <laughs> some of the questions? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the big thing for us, and like, like you said, Megan, is if there's anybody else, especially with, with other livestock types that wants to work with extension, talk with, talk with your local educator and let's see what we can do. I mean, we're always looking for new, new projects, new opportunities, new things to look at. Like, like Phil mentioned, you know, in the, in the chat there was the looking at grazing height. That's a great idea. Anything like that is, is definitely up our, up our alley and things that we're definitely looking to do as we see what can we do with this technology in livestock. Maybe with that, maybe just a quick reminder of, of the, um, the county, the UAV team across the state, you know, how many, how many educators, you know, how many UAVs, um, yep. how widespread is it? So we actually have coverage across the state. Um, not every, we don't have a UAV in every county by any means, but we have uh, pretty good coverage. I think we're up to 27 educators that, that are outfitted with UAVs across the state that are, that are certified to operate under part 107. Um, so pretty much, you know, even if it's not in that particular county within a county or, or maybe two, there would be someone that would have one that could, could get some of those things done uh, pretty well from north to south and east to west. Great. Just like always a good reminder uh, to folks uh, what we have out there across the state. Um, so with that, if I don't, um, if no one else unmutes themselves or drops a question in the chat, um, just a reminder, we do, um, we'll be back here next Next week, uh, still talking about livestock, but in a little different way uh, with Jackie Borman um, in Animal Sciences. Um, she'll be talking about a, a project she has uh, going with um, a commercial uh, company um, um, looking at uh, data utilization uh, pulled from a dairy farm. So looking forward to that. And then you'll see the next uh, few topics. Um, thank you for joining us. Like I said, we will um, we'll have the um, the presentation up on YouTube and we'll send that um, email out to the registration list. Um, and with that, I will give you back 10 minutes of your day to uh, enjoy this cold uh, wintry day here in Indiana. So thanks, John. Um, Thank you.
great presentation. Um, and also, I will say, if you didn't catch John, uh, he's been he's presented a couple in our winter uh, series um, and did a great job uh, there. So you can always go back to our YouTube uh, playlist and see those on the Digital Ag Resources site. So with that, have a great day and we'll see you next week.